Yes, hello. You're watching the Sunday Politics for Yorkshire and Lincolnshire coming up today. Why a Conservative-run council is calling on the government to look again at the so-called bedroom tax. Plus, we'll find out why some doctors are unhappy with changes to the way sexual health services are provided. Our guests today are David Ward, the Liberal Democrat MP for Bradford East, Alex Shelbrook, the Conservative MP for Elmish and Rothwell, and Dan Jarvis, the Labour MP for Barnsley Central. Hello to you all. Uh, well, the fallout continues this weekend from the Eastleigh by-election, but I want to ask you all, how will it affect the next election in our part of the world, in Yorkshire and Lincolnshire? David Ward. Uh, I have no idea, to be honest. Um, it's obviously a great result for us and things have been very difficult and it's good to get that result, but I'm uh, following the, the same answer really that I've given many, many times. I think we are in a, the midst of a change in British political history, I really do, with the coalition government, never had them before, and anyone who now can tell me that they know what is going to happen in even a couple of years' time, I just think they don't know what they're talking about. It, we're in a state of flux, we don't know how this thing will work out, uh, and I think the electorate is still trying to get to understand the coalition government and how it works, uh, and I think it's all up for grabs. There's a real danger for you now, Alex Shelbrook, that UKIP could eat into your majorities in those crucial Tory marginals in Yorkshire. I don't necessarily think that's true, actually. I think one of the interesting things about the Eastleigh by-election was that it showed that UKIP were gaining its vote almost in equal measure from each one of the main parties. So I don't have a concern about the UKIP threat to the Conservative Party. I have a concern of the UKIP threat in the same way as I do of a Liberal Democrat threat or a Labour threat. But I don't think it's specifically fo focused at the Conservative Party. And Dan Jarvis, I mean, Labour can hardly call itself a one-nation party, can it? I mean, your votes really collapsed in the South. You're being forced back to your heartlands here in the north, aren't you? Well, our vote didn't collapse. Our share of the vote I increased. I think what is potentially significant is that UKIP are, are beginning to demonstrate that they are a receptacle for those people who want to make a protest vote. And we'll all need to be mindful of that. I think the person who will be most worried, though, is David Cameron. David Davis said earlier this week that if the Tories came third, it would be a crisis. The Tories have come third. So let's see what the next few days bring. Well, we wait to hear more from David Davis, but let's move on to one of the biggest political talking points uh, at the moment. From next month, many social housing tenants will face cuts to their benefits if they have one or more spare rooms. The so-called bedroom tax was devised to tackle the problem of under-occupancy and to free up homes for families living in cramped accommodation. But there's been widespread political opposition to the plans, including complaints from a Conservative-run Yorkshire Council. This is my spare bedroom when we get it all sorted out. But at the moment, it's just cluttered up. Like many council tenants who rely on benefits, Adrian Hill and Patricia Miller are facing the prospect of paying more to stay in their own home in Goole. Well, it cost us £11 a week, roughly, and we struggle now at times, which I just think it's unfair what this uh, coalition government's doing to people what's out of work. You're a couple, you've no children. Why do you need a spare room? I started with restless leg syndrome. And that keeps me awake some nights, so it keeps my girlfriend awake. So either I sleep on settee or she sleeps in bed. Unemployed chef Andy Jackson says he'll also have to pay £11 extra a week for his spare room. So you're a single man on your own. Why do you need a two-bedroomed house? Because there's no single bedrooms. Just not around. Have you tried looking? Yeah, I've gone to private renting, and that's why, why, why I've gone private renting for. Because the council just haven't got anything. Why don't you take in a lodger? Because you don't know who you're taking in. And, and, and how do you know you're not going to go to bed and get a knife in your back? The so-called bedroom tax isn't strictly speaking a tax at all. It's a reduction in housing benefit for people of working age. So if tenants have a spare bedroom, they could lose 14% of their housing benefit. If they have two or more spare bedrooms, they'd lose 25%. The policy was defended this week by the Prime Minister. 
There are 250,000 families who live in overcrowded accommodation. There are 386,000 people who live in under-occupied homes. There are 1.8 million people who would love to have a council house who can't get one. Now, of course we need to build more social homes, and we're doing exactly that. But in the meantime, we should do everything we can to make sure those homes are used uh, in the most efficient and fair way. But one Conservative-controlled council isn't convinced by the government's proposals to tackle under-occupancy. I spoke to the housing portfolio holder for the East Riding of Yorkshire. The theory of trying to suit people's accommodation to their needs is good. But in the words of my granddad, if the theory doesn't work in practice, it's the theory that's wrong. And my own take on it is that it hasn't been thought through very well and that there are going to be some uh, quite difficult unintended consequences for uh, residents of the East Riding from this, these changes. We would love to be able to rehouse people but sadly currently there are not the smaller units available to move people to who would choose to move. It's horrible and it stinks. I think the coalition government should come over this side yeah. of the track where we are yeah. and come here for a week or two, live on our money yeah. and see what they feel yeah. like and then they'll know what it's yeah. like then. You can uh, rent your room out, but why should you rent your room out? The government insists its measures to tackle the problem of under-occupancy in social housing are fair and will ultimately free up homes for families. But the political debate shows no sign of being put to bed. So, Alex Shelburg, here we have a Conservative-run council in the East Riding of Yorkshire which has uh, reservations about the bedroom tax. What does that say about the policy? Well, it says that whenever you bring in a policy to try and um, address an issue, and there's a very serious issue, as was outlined by the Prime Minister at PMQs, then there are unforeseen circumstances, and that's why the government has a £155 million fund for councils to access to make sure that these unforeseen circumstances can be tackled. But do you still support the bedroom tax? Well, I want to make sure that we're trying to do something about the 250,000 people with no crowded accommodation. And, you know, it's not a tax. Let's get this absolutely clear. You did put this in your article, but it is not a tax. A tax is when you earn money and the government takes some away. This is a reduction in benefit, and the reasons for that is because we are trying to get these over-occupied families into these under-occupied houses. OK, Dan Javis, that's the argument. 250,000 people in overcrowded accommodation. How do you deal with that? Well, we've just heard a Conservative councillor say that this policy has not been thought through. The government's own figures show that two out of every three people who will be unfairly penalised by this are disabled. And it will also unfairly impact on foster parents, on grandparents who care for their grandchildren, on people who've got serving members of the armed forces in their families. Now, I, th I think this is not about making tough choices. This is about making the wrong choice. David Ward, did you vote for the bedroom tax? If no, you want to call it the bedroom tax? Uh, uh, no, I didn't, and uh, I'm opposed to it. I think there's uh, a lack of understanding. There is a difference between a unit of a, an accommodation and a home. You know, the place where you grew up, where your family grew up, where you buried the cat in the garden, where the auntie lives around the corner. Um, and I think that uh, it should also be very much at a local discretion. There's such a difference from area to area in t levels of unemployment, in terms of those who are on benefits, in terms of the u actual accommodation that's available. It should be at local discretion discretion and if introduced over a period of time phased in and also alongside a program of increased social house building. So how do you justify policies like this which were brought in by your coalition government? Um, well, I don't, as you've just heard. I don't justify it at all. We could have seen in simple terms people uh, overoccupied, people underoccupied, but you cannot introduce that this quickly without there being uh, really pretty poor repercussions. I mean, Alex Shabuk, this has the potential to be another poll tax, potentially, doesn't it? It's the poorest people paying, many would say, Labour would say, the millionaires are getting a tax cut. It's so hard for you to justify, isn't it? Well, I think we need to justify that it comes back to trying to do what's best for these families where, you know, we've got plenty of anecdotal evidence of children standing up in the kitchen trying to do their homework. We have a social housing shortage in this country. And actually, the one thing which hasn't been recognised in this argument is why is there no money to build social housing? Because the receipts which were kept from the council house sales were spent by Gordon Brown. Go on, John Jarvis, do you want to answer that? Of course we need welfare in place that is effective and compassionate, but it will be not lost on millions of people that these changes come in 
at precisely the time when the coalition government are giving a tax cut of £100,000 to some of the wealthiest people around the country. The truth is that the best form uh, of uh, best reform to, to welfare is to get people into work and that's precisely why we've said that the government should offer a compulsory job guarantee to put those people who've been out of, uh, out of work for a long time back into work. So, so Dan, just coming back on that point then, I mean, you know, this point's been made by the opposition on several occasions, is that would you also then not agree that it was wrong of the Labour Party to vote against limiting child benefit to those on £100,000? Um, you know, anybody on £60,000 above won't get child benefit, but the Labour Party voted against that and said everybody should get it. The money saved there could also go contrib contribute towards this. I, th I think we, of course we've got to pay down the deficit and of course we've got to look very carefully at the money that the, that the state pays out. And yes, I completely understand why people on high incomes um, should potentially not be receiving the kind of benefits um, that, that are universal. But the truth of the matter is, and what people will be screaming at the, the TV, is that we need policies in place that help people get back to work. So perhaps I could ask you, do you think it's a good thing that we, we've said that, that, that well, there should be a compulsory job guarantee scheme for those people who've been out of work for a certain amount of time, that the government would offer them a job and guarantee them We're employment. Long way All right, from, yeah, uh, but go, on, go on, David Ball. Well, this, this is a red herring, really, because we have a, a social housing uh, problem in this country. We've had it for, for many, many years, and that needs to be addressed. But you cannot do it overnight, and you cannot make those who are currently often, uh, as, as Dan has said, uh, who have disabilities or are certainly on low incomes, you cannot make those people pay for the adjustment in the social housing market. Uh, change of topic now, because... Doctors say they're concerned about the future of sexual health care in Yorkshire. Testing and education is currently the responsibility of the NHS, but from next month this will switch to councils who will be able to use private companies to run clinics, HIV tests and awareness campaigns. Now this all comes as Leeds is named as the first place in the region with a high prevalence of HIV. Anna Crossley reports. Adam was diagnosed with HIV five years ago. When he found out, he was frightened and unsure about his future, wrongly assuming he didn't have long to live. I remember the ads from the, from the 90s, so I, I actually thought that HIV equaled AIDS, equaled death. Uh, I believed that my life was going to be, my life expectancy was going to be about five years. Uh, I had no knowledge of HIV whatsoever. Adam's on medication and leads a completely normal life. But he didn't want to appear on camera because of the stigma that still surrounds HIV. He's been really happy with the care he's received from the sexual health clinic in Leeds. But big changes are afoot, which although won't affect his HIV treatment, could impact on the service as a whole. You see, come April, under the Health and Social Care Act, sexual health services will no longer be the responsibility of the NHS and instead they'll be run by local authorities who will put the service out to tender. So prevention and testing for things like HIV and STIs like chlamydia and gonorrhea could soon be done by private companies. I hope that local authorities will see that commissioning health services is a bit different to commissioning things like the bins where there is much more harm that can be done if you get it wrong. Although treatment for HIV will remain under the NHS, everything else surrounding testing and prevention could be run by a private company. And many doctors feel the current holistic approach, whereby sexual health and HIV services are closely linked, should continue. Sexual health services and HIV have always been commissioned separately, but there's been a much closer relationship between the two commissioners. They've both been within the NHS and they've tended to work closely together. Now the, 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 the difference between the commissioners is much wider apart. We've got local government which is not part of the NHS. So that split has widened. It's especially important in Leeds as the city has just been defined as an HIV hotspot. Three times as many people have tested positive in Leeds compared to the rest of Yorkshire and the Humber. And it's the first place in the region where one in every 500 people is infected. But of course, this doesn't include those who don't know they have it. 
Experts say it was only a matter of time before Leeds caught up with other major cities and the figures reflect the fact that people are being successfully treated for HIV and living longer. The challenge now is making sure that the situation is managed by whoever takes over the service. In a statement about the new commissioning process, Leeds City Council said it's important for people to know that existing services will continue whilst this review takes place. We are committed to continuing open access sexual health services for the people of Leeds that offer advice and support and also promote preventative work to all age groups. Some people believe this is a wake-up call for the NHS and it's about delivering the best value for the taxpayer, while others feel it's privatisation by the back door and will lead to profits before patients. Well, the Department for Health couldn't put anyone up for interview, but in a statement they said sexual health services are vital and will remain free. Councils will get a ring-fenced budget, which amounts to a real terms increase in funding. This will mean they can improve sexual health in their communities and make links to other vital services like housing, education and family support. Um, Dan Jarvis, are you happy with the way these changes are happening, changes to the way sexual services, sexual health services are provided? I think the context nationally is concerning. We've now waited 22 months for the government's sexual health policy. In that time, there have been 350,000 abortions and nearly 800,000 people have contracted sexually transmitted diseases. So I think the government need to get on it and deliver the strategy that they had promised. Where I think people will be really concerned is about the increasing influence of the private sector. The people that I talk to when I go to my local hospital or on the doorstep are very concerned about the increasing influence and the role of the market. I think we got it wrong towards the end of our time in government and I know that people are really concerned that the NHS is about delivering frontline care for patients and it should never be about profit. Yeah, is this the right time to be shifting services into the private sector, Alex Shell? Because a Leeds MP now leads us a high prevalence of HIV cases. This is The timing's not great, is it? Well, of course, I think the fundamental point which has to be recognised in the changes taking place is that Leeds City Council will have the ultimate power to decide where it needs to focus its resources rather than the holistic view of the area. Now, we talk about the fact that um, the, the cases of HIV are, are, are very high in Leeds, um, whether they are in areas of Leeds, in, in different communities, different housing areas, etc. I don't know. Hopefully the City Council would have information like that. But surely it's got to be better for the, the council, the people providing the services, to actually say we have to focus resources here rather than it's available on the NHS. Well, could you not? The company providing sexual health services in Teesside is called Virgin Health. Um, <laughs> make of that what you will. But people are still very suspicious, aren't they, David Ward, of health services being privatised? Well, I think they are, but it's not new, is it? And this it seems to be a, a myth, really, that all of a sudden there's going to be a privatisation that's never existed before. Private healthcare has always been there forever and a day in the um, in the health service. The only new thing I can add, really, is that we are in a state of flux. Uh, one of the good things, I think, uh, about recent changes um, is the uh, health and wellbeing boards and the local democratic involvement in defining local needs uh, through strategic analysis. Right, well let's get some more of the week's political news now. Len Tingle has our roundup in 60 seconds. Demonstrations on the streets of Hull as the City Council cut 600 jobs and defied the government by putting up local taxes by almost 2%. Is the austerity working? Is it working? The city's dying on its feet. A similar story from other Yorkshire Labour-led councils. These protests in York went on into the night. It's back to school for Bradford Lib Dem MP David Ward. Party leader Nick Clegg this week demanded he take lessons on when to use the word Jew. In backing a campaign against the Israeli government's treatment of its Palestinian population, he used the phrase Jewish atrocities and has since had to apologise. And apologies too from civil servants planning the new high-speed rail link from London. Apartment owners in Yorkshire's tallest skyscraper in Leeds were mistakenly informed the new line might go right through it. It's a confusion we regret. In a project of this size, mistakes shouldn't happen, but I'm afraid they do, and we do our best to try and eliminate them as we go forward. All right, well, let's go to David Ward first. The Liberal Democrat Friends of Israel say you should face further disciplinary action for your comment about the Jews. What's your response to them? 
I've been involved in, in uh, dealing with uh, racial prejudice and fighting racism for nigh on 30 years um, and I will continue doing that and I shall also continue to speak out for persecuted minorities uh, wherever they may be but particularly of course in this context uh, in Palestine and the treatment of the Israeli government against Palestinians. So you've got no if regrets? The if the language at times offends people I need to examine that, I need to think about uh, unintentional offence but I've apologized for using uh, the words that I'm told were offensive to many people and I am ready to move on and indeed back to the central issue of the behavior of the Israeli government and its uh, treatment of the Palestinians. You see when George Galloway, your fellow Bradford MP, was on our program a few weeks back, he said this was a shameless attempt to woo the Muslim vote. Well, this is, uh, I was att attacked this week of uh, shamefully uh, attempting to woo the Sikh vote when I was working with a, a large group of Sikhs who came to, to London this week. Uh, I represent my constituents and the concerns that they have. They bring them to me. Um, and uh, if it is a big issue for my constituents, it will be a big issue for me. I have nothing to apologize by on that score. Are you happy with David Wall's response? I, I, I do think David um, was completely wrong to use the language he used. I made that clear on the same programme George was on. However, David has apologised. He's moved on. As you've just heard him say then, he has an issue with the way the Israeli government handles the Palestinian situation. That is a perfectly legitimate view to hold in a free democracy. I was very uncomfortable with the use of the word Jews. I thought it was basically singling out a religious race. If David has views against the way the Israelis are handling a situation, that's fine. I'm glad he's apologised. I think he's right. It's time to draw the line and move on. Right, we will move on now. Uh, Dan Jarvis, this week we've seen Labour councils in Sheffield, Hull and York cutting services, cutting jobs. How can Labour complain about cuts when you're doing just that in your own town halls? Well, because the reason that Labour councils are, councils are having to make very difficult decisions is because of unfair spending solutions that have been imposed upon them by national government. I'm Shadow Culture Minister of Responsibility for Libraries. Libraries are an incredibly important service, but around the country and around the region, local authorities are, are looking to cut these services. That's not because they want to. You know, libraries are, are vital services that our communities need and use on a regular basis. But this is an incredibly tough time. Very, yeah, okay, uh, briefly. Uh, the only thing I'd say is, if, if, if it, you know, the situation is tough, we are in austerity, but the libraries have been shutting in Leeds, and, and, you know, and I think that's wrong, especially when the budget passed this week by the Labour Council gave a £1,000 pay rise to its top executives. There's a million pounds being spent on union time. We found out there's a £100 million art collection being insured, which is just stored in a chamber somewhere. You know, if it's out for public view, fair enough, but why are the frontline services being hit before some of these other areas can be looked at first? And briefly, David Ward, can local councils look to make cuts inside their own town halls? Well, they, they, must, uh, they must take responsibility for that. I've been in the same position uh, as a councillor having to make really pretty unpalatable cuts in, in the budget. There are some new freedoms for local authorities. This is not all bad news. The government, in terms of the freedoms of the localism bill, uh, the return of the business rate is giving greater discretion to local authorities on what they spend and how they spend it, and that's good. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you all for your time today. David Ward, Alex Shelbrook, Dan Jarvis. Now we will go back to Andrew Neil in London.